I thought 1999 might be the end of the world. Granted, I was 13 at the time, but the evidence was starting to pile up. You know, we, uh, there, there was this concern that, that computers were not going to be able to handle the switch from 99 to 00. zero. And I, my memory's a little fuzzy, but apparently that was going to cause all of the missiles on Earth to explode. Hollywood had released not one, but two movies very recently about an asteroid hitting the Earth and wiping out all life on the planet. There's, uh, those left behind novels. The, the ones about like kind of that certain take on the end times, they were like six deep and we were just waiting for people to just disappear and just like piles of clothes to be laying on the ground. And I don't know, there was something kind of complete, something poetic sounding about just a nice round 2,000 years. But because you are here with me or you're joining us online, that means that either you or your parents, perhaps, you managed to make it through that New Year's unscathed, and it was not the end of the world. The year 2020 has taken us for a bit of a ride, and not the Disney World fun kind. And you don't need me to rehash all of it for you, but when things like massive wildfires destroying large parts of Australia and a presidential impeachment trial are things you may have forgot happened this year, we can say it's been a little challenging. I think it's safe to say that we're, we, there's more challenge maybe even to come in 2020. And Maybe the thought has crossed your mind. I mean, maybe, maybe the reason you're joining us is because, I don't know, maybe someone on your social media feed like mine has said, I don't know, maybe this whole thing is just sort of, just sort of winding down. Maybe, maybe you've had some thoughts like these in your head. You know, I sent this, uh, this picture to my wife, kind of jokingly. This was back at the end of July. Um, because I opened up the calendar on my computer and after multiple attempts at refreshing it, shutting it down and bringing it back up, it would not show me anything past August 8th. <laughs> and I sent it to my wife and, and I said, I think my computer's trying to tell me something. Just, there's no reason. There's no reason to plan for anything else after August 8th. And I was ready to go and, and make up a sandwich board and just head out to the drive down there in front of Bayfront and just let people know, the end is near. <laughs> and maybe you've had some thoughts like that too. Maybe you've been in conversations with someone or heard someone post something. Maybe that's the reason why you joined us today. Maybe you're with us online because you've been having these kind of conversations. Maybe because of everything that we have been experiencing this year, we're facing, we're coming up near the end. You know, uh, it, it's really normal for humans to speculate on this, on the end of the world, whether it's going to be by natural disaster or, or a disease or violence or war. You know, some supernatural scenario that exists in most major religions and we, we make movies about it, we write books, uh, just kind of thinking about this idea. Sometimes we just find it hard to sleep thinking about it and wondering if maybe it's going to be soon. So for the next four weeks, we are, well, we're stepping into that as a church. You know, we believe that we have been given the Bible as a, as a gift from God, and it is where we receive our truth. And so we're going to go to the Bible, and we're going to take a look and see what it has to tell us about the end. You know, is 2020 something we should be worried about? Is, what it, does it mean to be living in the last days? How would we know? And, and what does that mean for me? And to start out this morning, I want us to all um, have the same frame of reference for what we're talking about whenever we, we as Christians specifically talk about the end of the world. The book of Hebrews in the New Testament, chapter 1, verse 1, says this. It says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times 
and in various ways. We would call this the Old Testament. The, the, the prophets spoke to the people about who God is, about what they needed to know about him. We learn there that, that God is a creator, that he created everything, that he created us that he kind of created us as kind of the, the masterpiece of his creation, that he created human beings in his own likeness, in his own image. And we learn from those, those prophets, from those Old Testament writers, that, that we as human beings, you know, we were given a, a purpose laid out to us by God, and that we sort of said, hey God, thanks for the whole creating us thing, but we're going to go do things our own way. And we, in our faith, we call that sin. And sin separated us from God. Sin broke that relationship. Sin really broke the entire world that we live in. It's the reason why it's not as it should be. I mean, long story short, sin is, is either directly or indirectly the cause of all unhappiness, all suffering, all death that we experience in this world. And sin, it created this eternal gap between us and God that we don't have the ability to fix. But then came the pivotal moment in all of human history. But in these last days, he, that's God, has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. God sent his son, the man that we know as Jesus, and he spoke the words of God, and he did the work that only God could do. We learn that he traded his life, his perfect life, and he gave it over to death for our sake so that we wouldn't have to die the death that we deserve. And that he has made the, the, uh, the chance for eternal life available to everyone who would call on him as their Lord and Savior, who would recognize the sin in their own lives and say, I need you, Jesus, for what you did for me. And the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. You see, after Jesus died on a cross for us, after he rose again, provided that purification for sins, Jesus returned to heaven for a period of time. And during that time, he gave his followers the privilege and the responsibility to go and tell the world about him. Tell them what he's done. Tell them how he, has, he died to save them and how he is this gift available of eternal, uh, of eternal life for anyone who would place their faith in him and who would walk with him. And Jesus, when he left, he promised that one day he was coming back that he would return, and when he returned, that he would usher everyone into their eternal destiny, either with him or separated from him forever. So when we as Christians, this is what we are talking about whenever we talk about the end of the world. You know, not, not a war, not a plague, not a natural disaster, the triumphant return of Jesus. And we've been waiting for about 2,000 years. That's a long time coming. And so we ask ourselves, should we be more ready now? I mean, is, is, is this the year? Should, should we be ready? Should we be expecting it? And what does being ready even mean? And Christians, we've been asking and we've been debating these questions, I mean, really ever since Jesus left. 
The Christians have, have looked to some of the prophecies that we read in the Bible and looked to their own current events of their day and tried to anticipate the last days, tried to anticipate the return of Jesus. And they were guessing about when this was going to be all the way back in the time the New Testament was being written, all the way up to, I mean, even this last week. I had several people on my Facebook, of my Facebook friends inform me that we needed to be extra aware last week of the return of Jesus. And in a way, Christians who have believed that they were living in the last days have always been right. You see, it says there in Hebrews 1 that in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son. And that doesn't mean how we might take it in kind of our modern English. You know, in these last days, oh yeah, you know, the last few days or in the last couple of years, Jesus has been talking to us. No, the author of Hebrews uses the word in Greek meaning the end days. You see, religious scholars at the time that Hebrews was written, they really saw all of history taking place in kind of two large movements. There was everything that happened before God sent his promised Messiah, who we believe to be Jesus of Nazareth. And then there was everything that happened after that Savior came that they referred to as the last days. Ever since Jesus came, we, everyone, has been living in the last days. But that's kind of like, that's kind of like everybody getting a participation trophy, isn't it? I mean, if everybody wins, nobody wins. I mean, sure, in a, in a broad sense, we have been living in the last days since the time of Jesus, but, but we know that eventually a generation has to be walking the earth at the moment that Jesus makes his grand return. And some Christians have, have honestly lived their lives almost in obsession to looking at the signs of their time, looking at their age, and trying to anticipate very specifically the return of Jesus. This has led to more than a few embarrassing occurrences where predictors have gotten it wrong. Which is why this series is not 20 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 2020. <laughs> we're, we're actually going to spend very little time over the next four weeks looking at some of the more veiled biblical prophecy. You know, there, there are some who, who spend their lives obsessing over, studying over some of this prophecy, but sometimes Christians can lose the forest in the trees when it comes to this area. Like we can get so focused on the mysterious details that we can't be certain about that we miss that the big picture is of what we need to know, the big picture of what we need to know about the end, Scripture is actually pretty clear. Jesus himself, he talked about the last days before his return. In Matthew chapter 24, if you want to open your Bible and turn there with us, we'll have it on the screens as well. But in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus' disciples, his followers, they asked him, Lord, like, when are these days coming? What should we be looking for? And starting in Matthew 24 verse 4, Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom kingdom, there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. All right, so first thing I want to point out that we should all be aware of about the last days is that people are going to try to deceive you about the last days. 
People are going to want to throw you off, whether it is in a grab for power or for money or for other reasons. Enemies of Christ, both human and supernatural, are going to want us to get this wrong. And so it is so important for us to heed what Jesus says, to be ready, to be on the watch for these things. That for us means knowing what the Bible says so that we aren't thrown off by what people are saying. Wars, famines, natural disasters, these are the signs that we look to, you know, of the last days. But Jesus says these are not necessarily the high alert signs that we sometimes treat them like you know we we sometimes see some of these kind of things happening and we go here we go (laughs) this is it but jesus says not to be alarmed by these things i mean again we've we've been living in the last days for a long time and the world has been experiencing these kind of things for a long time i mean folks this this ain't the first global pandemic. You know, this is not the, the worst political season that a country has ever experienced in the history of the world. World War II was not the first world war. The title helps you out with that one. <laughs> Jesus, he refers to, to the be, these things. He refers to these events as the beginning of birth pains. I, I think my wife's birth pain started about four weeks into her pregnancy. <laughs> I mean, the, the sickness, the discomforts, and, and I mean, even, even when we got into that moment of active labor, you know, we were still 14 hours away from having our first kid. So, Jesus says that just because you see some of these signs, it doesn't mean you should get all in a tizzy. Now, he doesn't say don't care. He doesn't say don't care. Just be mindful of calling it game over whenever maybe the third quarter just started. Especially whenever people try to tell you, hey, this specific event is tied to this specific thing in the Bible because the Bible just isn't always that clear about it. Now Jesus goes on in this passage, verse 9. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. It's Jesus' words here that, that encourage me to say that I believe Christians should be very aware of the signs of the age that we live in. And that Christians should also be very aware, not getting carried away with the idea that it is the end of the world. See, what Jesus says here, it, it, it reminds me of how, in, in my experience, Christians in the United States, we can get a little bit America-centric about some of these things. I mean, have we had a challenging year in the U.S.? Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, some of our brothers and sisters in the faith in other countries, they have been persecuted, they have been killed for following Christ for centuries. You know, we we have seen some of our religious freedoms challenged, absolutely. But we don't see all nations hating Christians. You know, in some places, the good news of Jesus is just in its infancy. I mean, it's just starting to spread like wildfire. 
I was on the phone with a, with a guy from a missionary organization this past week, and he was telling me about how just in the last few weeks, 140 people have given their lives to Jesus in this area in Niger, where less than 1% of the population are Christians. God is at work. We, you know, I do. I look at what Jesus said, and I do see a diminishing amount of love that people have for one another. I do see some people turning away from their faith. So absolutely, we should be on alert. But let's not miss the fact that God is still moving and active outside of our corner of the earth. He's got the whole world in his hands. But I get it. I mean, I get us anticipating it. I get the desire that we have as Christians longing for Jesus to return, especially when we see examples daily of how the world is not as it should be. And it does. It begs the question, what's taking so long? Peter, one of Jesus' first followers, he anticipated that question being asked, and not just by faithful believers who were longing for Jesus to come back, but by people who were skeptical, unbelievers who were using Jesus' delay as a, as a reason not to, not to seek him out, not to embrace what he had to say. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3, he wrote, above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. And Peter, he was writing 30 or so years after the time of Jesus, and he was already expecting that people were going to say, yeah, I don't think he's coming. And here we are 2,000 years later. And it's a posture that people have continued to take ever since then. I mean, if Jesus was coming back, he'd have done it by now. I mean, he, he wouldn't have let the Crusades happen, or the Black Plague, or the Holocaust. Where is this coming of Jesus? And people use this as an excuse to continue rejecting Jesus and what he did for them and his desire for them to come know him. They, want, they use it as an excuse to keep chasing after sin. And these, these momentary pleasures that, if we're honest, don't really make up a more satisfying life. You jump down to verse 8. Peter writes, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting to anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God, he doesn't experience time like we do. God is an eternal being in his existence. And I mean, for him, the future is just as present as, as the present is in our experience. I sort of think of it like God is, is involved in this, in this cosmic chess match. You know, God against, against human sinfulness and against supernatural forces of evil. But God, he can see the entire chessboard. He can see the whole match as it is played out from the very beginning to the very end. And he's making moves hundreds of years ago. They may make no sense to the people who are experiencing them because he knows that it will lead the most number of people to call on Jesus as their Savior today. And he's making moves today that make no sense to us that he knows will lead the greatest number of people to know and follow him in the future. His slowness 
I mean, in, in our sense, his slowness, it is entirely for our benefit. I mean, he is ultra patient. How patient are you when someone who is under your charge disobeys you? Especially when it's to their own detriment. I mean, I'm patient with my kids' disobedience for about 10 seconds. Five, whenever they are hurting someone else or hurting themselves. And God has been patient with our disobedience for millennia. Because He desires that no one would experience eternity apart from Him. Because it's going to be bad. This is not my favorite part of our faith to talk about. But we have to talk about it. I mean, every good thing that you have in your life comes from God. Any happiness you experience, any peace, whether you follow God or not, they are gifts from God. An eternity apart from him means eternity apart from everything good. That's what hell is. You know, God, he sometimes gets painted in this picture of being this cruel God whenever we talk about eternal life without him, when the reality is that we are the ones who choose to separate ourselves from God, not the other way around. And in eternity we truly experience the consequences of what it means to be separated completely from the goodness of God. There is no good left. All that's left is to suffer. And God has been patient with us for thousands of years because He does not want to see that eternity for anyone. He longs for everyone to come to repentance, to turn away from sin, and to embrace Jesus for the gift of eternal life. When it comes to all of these last days conversations, God's timing should draw us to Him. I can't tell you if 2020 is the end or not, But I can tell you that the bad that we've experienced in this year, I mean, all of these signs of the last days, they should get our attention. I had a friend uh, that I worked with in high school, and she she had some Christian beliefs, but in her own words, she would be the first to tell you that she was not living in a way that she believed would honor God, in a way that she thought God might want her to be living. And I remember this one conversation that we had so vividly because we were talking about these kind of things. We were talking about, you know, end times, last days, Jesus' return. And, and, and she said something to the effect of, you know, I'm, I'm just going to keep having my, my fun for now. But when I start seeing some of those, you know, biblical signs of the end times, well, that's when I'm going to, you know, just straighten up. That's when I'm going to try and get things right with Jesus. Like she was waiting for rivers to run red with blood and trumpets to start blowing in the sky. And that's when, you know, that's when she would, she would try to, to figure Jesus out. And there's a lot in that that made me sad. Not least of which is the idea that you have your fun before you become a follower of Jesus. And then whenever you become a follower of Jesus, the party stops. And that's, that's another sermon for another day. But for today, the question is, what are you waiting for? God has been so patient with us. And it doesn't need to get any more apocalyptic in the signs. I mean, the thing about birthing pains is that whenever they start, that may not be the moment to to freak out but it is certainly the moment that you need to start taking action. 
And we live in this broken world. We're experiencing it every day, whether Jesus is returning tomorrow or not. And you know, next week, we're going to talk about how even in spite of this long delay we've experienced, we are called to live like it could be today. So if you don't know Jesus, he has been patiently waiting for you. And the signs are all around you that the world is not what it should be. And I don't know if Jesus is going to come back tomorrow. I don't know if he's going to come back a thousand years from now. But I know for sure that tomorrow is one less day you have. God loves you. He has a purpose for your life. He longs for you to follow him, to, to, to accept what his son did for you, the son he gave to die for you. He's been waiting and waiting and waiting so that you might not have to face an eternity apart from him. And if you don't, follow Jesus, or if maybe you made that decision at some point in your life and you've been walking away, I am calling you to make a decision to follow Jesus today. We're going to move into a time of communion, and this is a moment for those of us who are believers, who are followers of Jesus, to stop and remember the goodness of our God, remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. We invite you to take a piece of bread that will remind you of his body, drink from a cup that would remind you of his blood poured out on that cross for you. As we stop and say, thank you. As we thank him for his patiently waiting for us to receive what it is he had done for us on that cross. But if you're here in the room today and you aren't a follower of Jesus, or if you haven't been walking with him, now would be a great time to have that conversation. I'm going to take a spot over on the side. And if you feel led, I would love to talk to you about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. If you're with us online, some of our church staff is there with you right now. And we would ask you to just let us know in the comments and we'll connect with you. And help you have a conversation about what it means to follow Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we love you, Lord. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you for your long-suffering patience. God, that you have allowed human beings to continue on paths that are apart from you, Lord, because you love us so much and you want us to have every moment, every opportunity to come to know and follow you. Holy Spirit, I ask that if there is someone listening today who needs to make a decision to follow you, Jesus, who needs to turn their life back towards you, Holy Spirit, convict them now that they would not wait, that they wouldn't wait another day, another hour without making that decision to know you more, Jesus. And for those of us who have embraced the message of the cross and what you have done for us. We thank you for the gift of eternal life that we eagerly look forward to as we watch our broken world around us and know that whether it's now, whether it's a long time off, that you are coming, Jesus, that we can have hope in that. We give this time to you now, Jesus, and it is in your name that we pray. Amen.